good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manu Sakya, and I would like to welcome you all in this episode 26 of Student Lecture Series. And today uh, we have invited uh, one of our friends, uh, his name is Boli, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, the domain generalization. So his talk will be related to generalizable uh, kind of thing. So uh, before we start at the presentation um, talk, uh, I would like to request all of you to mute yourself. And once the presentation is over, you can uh, directly ask questions to him. Or if you are not in a position to say, say things, you can simply write down your question in the chat box and I will repeat that one. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, Boli, uh, mm -hmm. let me quickly uh, give a very short introduction about uh, Mr. Boli. Uh, Boli, he's a second year student, I guess, and uh, he is uh, in, in the lab, so-called S lab, and his professor is So Wei Liu, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. So, and uh, he has been doing his uh, research related to generalizable visual recognition and visual language related problem. And uh, before the presentation uh, starts, let me um, let me congratulate Boli for for uh, your paper has been accepted in ICLR, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. So congratulate for that one. It's a very tough one. I know that it's very tough ICLR. Uh, it's top uh, conference. And uh, without any further, uh, delay, uh, you can share your presentation and start uh, presentation slide and start the presentation. Molly? Okay, 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 cool. Uh, uh, can, can you see this page? Yes, yes, yeah. we can, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, um, so today I will like present the topic, uh, what makes good architecture in domain generation? Uh, and I should uh, state it previously, uh, uh, it it concludes uh, our like uh, findings uh, about the domain generalization topic, <clears throat> and I I will first uh, introduce. <clears throat> uh, so I will first uh, so I will first introduce the setting of domain generalization. But I should uh, like say uh, today's topic on domain generalization may be the uh, is a is a most uh, recent. Uh, about the most recent paper. So I will like quickly bring up the history of domain generalization, but I will talk about something different. Uh, so, so our findings are like particularly different from the uh, history of uh, So simply speaking, the domain generalization problem is that, um, so many of us would imagine that we could train an image classifier or detector or segmentation algorithms like on certain images and hope it to generalize to like on same images. So here is the an example. Uh, like if you train the uh, image classifier on photo images, uh, how would it work on sketch images? That's how uh, that's how researchers on demand generations this era are thinking about. And here's a, a few examples on three benchmarks on three data sets of, about demand generation. So the first is digits. There are like different domains of digit images, the meanest, the meanest M and the SV, HN, uh, SYN. They are all contains uh, zero to nine images, but they are with different styles, different backgrounds and different colors. Uh, and the VLS, the, these images are also, are also the same types of the car, but from captured from the different viewpoints, di different viewpoints, different environments and different, like uh, different, uh, the, uh, how, how to say the uh, the the um, the the lightings different the the lightings in environment lightings and also the P, P, PICS the um, the images are just looking very different but they are the same describing the the different kinds of dogs. <clears throat> uh, yes, and on um, so previously the dimensionization can be categorized into the uh, the following. Um, so, uh, can can be categorized into the into the following uh, following categories. Uh, so the first is domain manipulation, and the second is representation learning, and the ensemble learning, and the meta learning. Uh, I will quickly go through 
<coughs> sorry. <coughs> I, I will quickly go through the uh, these few categories. <coughs> um, so basically, the representation learning. <coughs> Uh, basically, the representation learning in dimensionalization mainly comes from the idea that we want to extract the best possible in environment features so that the classifier would not be falsified by environment changes and all the style changes and many other shifts. The many famous algorithms on learning environment features or environment risks, for, for example, like uh, there's a famous paper called IRN, could also be categorized into this category. Uh, with respect to its optimization goals. So this picture uh, shows that we want to, uh, for different domains of images, the, the dog, we want to ex uh, have a feature extractor that can extract like the domain environment complement, uh, co components that, so that the classifier could give its predictions based on the environment feature. Uh, Maybe possibly the environment features uh, in this three domains of dogs are the the, the shapes the uh, the shape of the dogs, and uh, they want to disentangle the domain specific complement components and the domain environment complement components, so that the classifier would not be falsified by the domain specific uh, information. For example, the clip art, uh, the, the styles are the domain specific information. Um, yes, and this is a, um, the the summary uh, summarization of the representation learning based dimensionalization. And here is a, another category it's called ensemble learning based dimensionalization. Uh, it basically aims using different models, the same architecture, but different uh, models to learn different uh, to 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 learn. Uh, to learn in different domains. And uh, they utilized uh, a, a new network called Domain, General, uh, Domain Gen Generalizer Network to conclude the model's predictions for the new domain. Uh, and that, that, that's how it works um, um, basically in, in, in this category. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, and, and also the meta learning based dimensionization is also. Uh, similarly, I, I think it's similarly to the representation learning based DG uh, because it aims to like simulate the the training and the the train the train and the test domain shift during training by synthesizing some like virtual test domains within each mean batch. And the the, uh, the meta learning optimization goal is to hope to learn a, a, a meta network that can handle the predictions rules in different domains so that it so so it helps the the meta network is more generalizable when testing on the uh, target domain on the unseen target domain and uh so so uh, so this 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 may be a few like uh quick introductions on the like previous history of dimensionalization and um whatever uh they utilize the different approaches to uh want to solve this problem by like extracting the environment feature uh, or utilizing the meta network uh, to 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 hope to narrow a meta network that can handle um, can handle the predictions in each domain. But I I need to uh, state that uh, for now we find that there's maybe some potentially they, there's maybe some a few limitations uh, of the uh, history uh, of of the previous algorithms. Uh, it's because that many years of the DG research focused on playing with given architecture, for example, the ResNet 18 and the ResNet 15 on um, a well-known domain bad benchmark. Uh, so, and their initial, but the, but the domain bad benchmarks, the, uh, their initial objective is to fairly evaluate the DG algorithm with a given architecture. Uh, so they limited the usage of the architecture and uh, uh, they limited the high parameter selection through uh, they, they hope to fairly evaluate uh, all kinds of digital algorithms. And their conclusion is kind of weird, but, uh, but it's also well received, uh, well received and well accepted that many digital algorithms are not significantly better than Vanilla ERM algorithm. Uh, the, also, is the baseline of DG. So the ERM algorithm is, uh, so maybe the, uh, the term is, uh, I, I need to 
uh, I need to expand the term. So ERM is uh, a short a, a short of the empirical uh, risk minimization. It just simply combines all the domains into training together. Do not do not consider the difference of the domains. It just simply combine the together. So it's called the baseline of DG. And and uh, detailedly, you can see the results from the <clears throat> from from the domain bed. Uh, you can see that uh, when evaluate on a large of data sets, the performance of uh, recently proposed domain generation algorithms are not significantly better than ERM. Some of them are even are, are even way way um, are even underperform uh, than ERM. But ERM is uh, like twenty years ago so everything. So so th is that basically says um uh the recently DG's um the the researchers in D in, in DG's areas are not pushing forward. Um but I, I'm not thinking uh that um so I uh so we just find it that uh if we limited the usage of the architecture so uh only developing the uh, so you can see that uh in the main bed is limited like to some extent a limited usage of the uh, network it it has a a, a given the a, a given uh, featureizer and a given uh, classifier so many algorithms are just uh uh are just uh, searching the are just searching the best uh loss functions or the best optimization schedules uh yes yeah, so, um Sorry, I um, so I, I mentioned the like the few papers on um, on like searching the a better loss functions and the better optimizing dashing schedule, mm -hmm. um, and um yes, but um so um so this um, so for um from this page we can conclude that uh probably um in the twenty uh, in the uh, twenty twenty one, uh, in the year twenty twenty one, uh, so many algorithms are, are 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 not just uh, significantly uh, outperform uh, than each other. Uh, is is it uh, uh, is it something that we should consider uh, as a new direction for the domain generation era? So uh, we are motivated from from like. Uh, outside this area's research, um, uh, with, so this is uh, like the three directions, three, three famous papers where we're motivated from the the vision transformers are robust learners and the understanding the brownness of transformer and the uh, neural architecture search for out, out of distribution generation uh, and also as well partly motivated from this uh, uh, a lot of few papers there. Um, so. Uh, like when it comes to um, 2022, uh, we we could observe that uh, the 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 many uh, many many big companies or the many uh, many research labs are uh, are pursuing the uh, a term called foundation models. They wish to like um, train a, a a large scale train models to to improve the performance in different kind of areas in natural language processing and in the visual language tasks. But uh, the, the domain generation uh, era may be limited from uh, the previous uh, defined rules. So we uh, aim to rigorously to study, uh, could we jump out of the box to, to thinking some, uh, something different? Um, so here are some like results uh, of the vision transformers uh, when it compares to ResNet. Uh, you can see the uh, it has a difference uh, the patterns under the adversarial perturbations compared to with the VIT and the risk nets. Um, so this uh, so this is basically because of the VIT process the images uh, token by token. It uh, will cut the images into a uh, sixteen times sixteen tokens uh, and process it individually. Uh, and uh, here is a more vivid re results uh, to to demonstrate the difference. You can see that uh, you, you can see that the largest VIT model VIT L uh, sixteen uh, nurse features under PGD attacks 
may already have some clues on, on the bird shape. And the noises are, are different between uh, the, the noises type, the patterns, the noises patterns are different between the VIT and the ResNet. The VIT has like much more vivid, com much more vivid comparison between the foreground and the background. Uh, it already likes have some clues on the uh, bird shape uh, with only the classification guidance. It do not have uh, any more separation signal. And here's a, also a famous paper called uh, the Dino, a self-surprised trained VIT. Uh, the class tokens attention is nicely associated with the object shape. Uh, it is a it's a very astonishing result because it, it do not use uh, any segmentation signals, but it just uh, like performing the classification task, but the uh, attention mechanism in VIT already learned the shape. Uh, it, uh, uh, and and, and the, 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 shape, the shape environments is the, like most of the most, the most important information we want to extract uh, from different domains. Uh, so, uh, so curiously, um, observing like previous research from the vision transformer from the, uh, from, uh, from, from the large, in general, the computer vision era, we can observe that, um, we can observe like some interesting clues that maybe the architectures would be important, uh, in discovering, a a, a better and, a um, uh, effective algorithms. So, uh, how to, how could we define uh, the importance of architecture? So, so there is a, um, a a term in machine learning called the inductive bias. Uh, so, uh, we naturally think that um, maybe a better um, a better architecture. Uh, so, so from the from the perspective of the inductive bias, we maybe. Uh, think that um, uh, if we have so this this is a wicked definition on the inductive bias. This is uh, like a complicated one, but uh, I refer to simply speaking that um, if we have a better assumptions on the models on the architectures, we, which will guide the predictions on our same data, and more using my words to to explain the inductive bias is that. If we choose the correct architecture, it will be easier to predict on some data. Uh, it's like the the varieties on the uh, the varieties results previously I showed. So, how to measure this kind of inductive bias? Um, what what? Uh, so, we here we find some like concrete definitions to describe inductive bias. We found a good explanation and a framework called orthogonal alignment. It's developed by a famous research. Uh, a, a famous researcher from MIT uh, in uh, especially inside uh, in the graph neural network era, uh, he proposes the concept of algorithmic alignment. It mainly concludes that how a learning algorithm or, or a neural network uh, with SGD training would align with its target function, and he and he proves that the GNN is aligned with the Bellman forward algorithm. So, uh, so his results basically can conclude in one sentence is that a simple GNN aligns Bellman for the algorithm, and then it easily learns the algorithm compared to a giant MLP. So it's basically say that you can use GNN to better learn the Bellman for the algorithm compared to the G compared to a, a a very large MLP. So, uh, so these two results uh, is is gradually. Uh, so, so, so our um, our focus is is gradually uh, come motivated by by the VIT's emergence and the uh, the the theoretical foundations of the algorithmic alignment, and and so this concludes our uh, recent uh, accepted papers called the sparse mixture of experts are domain generalizable learners, um, yes, and. Um, so here's the four, like how, how can we uh, combine the architectures? Uh, how can we like investigate the dimension generation uh, from the architecture perspective? So I, here I should have the like 
some complicated preliminary uh, on, on on defining the on on, on some def definitions. So here is the first is the latent factorization, uh, and um, the factorization is basically uh, you can say it like a disentanglement of the features of the uh, of the data generation process. Uh, consider is we uh, we should consider a joint distribution of the input x and the corresponding attributes uh, a one to a k. Uh, so where a i uh, will belongs to a, a finite set of the large a i. So the label can depend on one or multiple attributes. For a concrete example, we can say that uh, consider a large a i equals to the red and blue, the set of red and blue, and the large a two uh, equals to it. Uh, uh, ellipse or the square, but the label Y may be only relied on the attributes A2. Uh, so it uh, so it, it does not have any re relations uh, to the colors, but it only has uh, it, it only has connections to the uh, ellipse and the square. So also in computer vision errors, the attributes are named as the value attributes and they follow the similar data generation process. Um, and and uh, second is of uh, algorithmic a uh, formal definition of, of the algorithmic alignment. So uh, basically, in in my words, it simply characterizes the easiness of the tasks by mirroring the similarity between the architecture and the target function. Uh, then the the alignment is formally defined that uh, how it is it, defined as the following. Uh, so by this definition, we could conclude like. Uh, uh, a relative uh, value to compare uh, one architecture and another architecture, which is more aligned with our target function uh, in dimensionalization. Uh, and then we should, after um, after define after definition of the algorithmic alignment, so we should have uh, we should also define the target functions in DG. Uh, this may be like sort of complicated, but I will ex explain in, in uh, as possible in simple words. Uh, so first to have a tractable analysis for, for nonlinear functions approximation, we should first make assumptions on the distribution shift. So this basically the assumption here is to guarantee that uh, the, training and the, the training distribution and the test distribution have the same support. Uh, it's like in, uh, it's like in different domains, uh, we should have a, we should have a, a, a something to learn that is environment, so that we can learn this uh, target functions and we can learn this uh, architectures to align with the target functions. Uh, so here we, uh, for example, the in in our data sets. Uh, in different domain, in, in different domains, different categories. Uh, it has something to conclude as the environment to to be to be learned. For example, maybe the the to recognize the elephant, uh, you should uh, you you should conclude what uh, what what is the dip, uh, what is what the elephant is defined uh, like uh, it's defined by by the shape it's defined by the uh, by the nose, uh, and uh, uh, it's defined by the postures, uh, the working postures, um, and also as well as other categories. Um, there are something like uh, overlappings from domains to domains that we can conclude from uh, learning from the each domains. So basically, uh, so uh, based on this assumption, so we can conclude, uh, we can we can forward our. Uh, uh, our theoretical analysis in the next step. Um, and uh, so here we propose our uh, another two assumptions uh, afterwards. Uh, the first is the environment correlation is basically what I said is uh, the, the, the environments that we can conclude from each domain, like the, the shape environment, the, the environments on the, on the shape, uh, uh, like uh, each domain's elephant would have the a similar shape. Uh, each each domain's apple would have also have the similar shape. And also, is the spurious correlation. It's uh, uh, it, it points out it, uh, it, it, re it it relates to the domain specific informations on each domain, and that's what 
uh, we need to avoid uh, during our learning. Um, and um, yes, and with uh, then we could extend. Uh, so this is uh, from the previous definition, then we could extend the oxymic alignment definitions in DG. So theorem one uh, basically shows that the networks aligned with environment collisions are more robust to distribution shapes. So here, GC and GS are both nerd functions within a net neural network, and GC aligns with the environment correlation and GS aligns with the spurious correlation. And let's recall what oxymic alignment said. If the neural architecture is more aligned with environment correlation and less aligned with spurious correlation, then this architecture is better at dimensionalization tasks. That's what we conclude inside our paper. It's simply speaking that if we have a new neural architecture that could align with the environment correlation and less, less aligned with the spurious correlation, then it's a good architecture in, in our paper's uh, assumptions. So what is a good architecture? Uh, so previously, there's a lot of complicated analysis, but what is a good architecture? Here, we connect to our previous uh, previous statements that we opine that VIT is better aligned with the environment correlations in dimensionalization tasks than the pre than the CN based architecture like ResNet. Here's a, a performance comp com comparisons. Um, we use the SOTA CN based algorithms vs a vanilla trained VIT. You can see that uh, without sophisticated uh, training objectives without sophisticated loss designs, a simple VIT and uh, with comparable parameters would easily outperform the SOTA CNN based algorithms. That's interesting. Uh, and that's also aligned with our previous analysis and our previous uh, observations. Uh, and here's also the explanations on like some, some explanations we find uh, on relevant papers. Why is VIT better than ResNet? Uh, we didn't, actually we didn't investigate uh, in this objective deeper, but we opine that VIT's multi-head attentions are, uh, as the paper said, uh, low pass filters, and it will naturally more aligned with the shape. While the convolutions are have high pass filters, and it will be like more sensitive to texture bias. Hmm. Yes, and uh, previously we conclude that uh, from both empirical and uh, uh, observations side and uh, also uh, theoretical side, we conclude that a, a good architecture will naturally lead to a good algorithms in dimensionalization task. And we conclude that VIT is better than CNN based architectures in dimensionalization task. And next we uh, we will go further step, one, one further step from the VIT to sparse MOE. So this is a paper, this is a sentence called from the uh, recent famous paper, the Google's famous paper, POM, Scaling Language Modeling with Poms. Um, so in, in, inside POM, uh, they trained a, a, they trained a 400, uh, 540, 40, million, 40 billion parameters models. And in such a, a, such a giant uh, pre-trained models, they also introduce with some efficient ways to, to scale models from the million scales to billion scales. Uh, and the mixture of extra bursts is a natural way, is a natural and efficient way to scale from the, from the VIT. So motivated from this claim, we want to investigate could we go further from the VIT to the MOE? And if we, what if we study uh, the architecture side from the MOE? Would MOE better than VIT? Would MOE better than CN? So, uh, so MOE is basically, so what is the MOE? So basically you can imagine that, uh, you can imagine the MOE is the fat VIT. Uh, in each layer, the FFN, the feed forward layers in M in VIT, the uh, we we short it as the FFN is it's uh the MLP 
is expanded to multiple uh, MLPs, multiple FFNs, uh, and serve as the experts. Uh, the experts. So in Google's implementation, they can they can place each FFN on different device and uh, maximally encourage parallel training using MOE architecture. And each FFN inside the MOE would process certain image tokens and give it give it back to the results together to next layer process. So inside the MOE, the image tokens are maximally falsified to put into different experts. Uh, and here we would uh, further investigate would such sparsity encourage better generation performance. Um, and uh, we can define that, uh, we, we can formally define an MOE layer by expanding the VITS FFN definition. Uh, so one VIT layer is composed of an multi-head attention, the MHA layer and an feed forward neural network, the FFN layer. In the MOE layer, the FFN is replaced by mixture of experts and each expert is implemented by an FFN. Uh, and here's a, like a, a, a definition of the, uh, of the new architecture. Uh, and here's a, a more vivid uh, the diagram of this architecture. You can see that uh, different domains, elephant, the elephant in different domains, after the patch embedding, they would be processed into a, a small token and uh, pushing forward, uh, put, put together and uh, sent to the MOE block uh, after the multi-head attention to build the attentions from uh, block to, uh, from the token to token. And then the tokens are assigned to different experts uh, to, to process individually uh, uh, with the cosine routers. Um, so here's way, uh, we, we just, I, I just uh, put the, 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 this results uh, a little bit earlier, but you can see that the during training, the experts would uh, automatically uh, uh, automatically uh, be an expert of certain visual attributes of the elephant, um, and you can see that the the red the expert one the the red experts uh, are mainly processed the head and the ears, and the expert two are mainly processed the posture and the skins and uh, other other experts are processed other visual attributes here. Uh, and motivated by these observations and results, we can further extend our axiomatic alignment. Uh, we can use this tool to analyze that MOE layer aligns with multiple visual attributes of um, uh, during training. It, simply speaking, so there's uh, also the complicated analysis, but simply speaking, uh, this, uh, this theorem is, is basically states that the MOE is executing the, uh, the algorithms we call the conditional sentence, sentences. What is conditional sentences? It basically says that if you encounter the image looks like a head, you assign it to certain experts. That's uh, we call the conditional sentences. It's like if what equals to what, uh, then applies to uh, applies expert one to process this token. We opine that if the training data can be decomposed to the multiple visual attributes, then MOE layer would be naturally fit for uh, the conditional sentences and would be naturally uh, a good choice to process this types of data. And yes, um, previously we analysis uh, the uh, the benefits of MOE layer compared to the uh, simply VIT. So uh, basically, you can imagine that VIT only has uh, one expert because it's one only ha only have one FFN. So it means that you should you should give all tokens to the to the to the experts. It's like uh, you can only you can only nerve one. Uh, you can only learn a unique uh, environment representation, but with the with the MOE layer, you have multiple experts. Usually, the n equals to eight or or twelve or or even larger. 
you can have the multiple experts and, and the experts can merge the environment visual attributes from multiple domains individually. Uh, yes, and uh, so here we also investigating some something further uh, from the MOE is we call it the generalizable MOE. Uh, so first we investigate on the routing function. Routing, routing function. Previous MOE, uh, they are um, they mainly implemented with a simple linear uh, routing because they do not care about the they they do, they, they do not care about the the uh, the the alignment uh, of the routing functions because uh, they do not consider like the, in the generalization scenario. But in our scenario. Uh, we find that it's important to use a normalized uh, cosine route, cosine routing mechanism. It's just like uh, we show that in this in this page because it would better align with like uh, the head uh, in different domains images. Um, and also the layer configurations is also important. Uh, in many uh, well known the uh, MOE paper, they, they mainly use the every two layer configurations to encourage the maximal sparsity. But we find that we may use some last few layers configurations to like encourage highly transformed layers, uh, uh, highly transformed the features to be sparsified. Uh, the, the the details or the, the details is look like uh, if we have a uh, twelve blocks of MOE architectures. Uh, Every two configurations it look like uh, start from the uh, start from the layer one. You place the GMOE block, and then uh, every two layer you place the GMOE uh, block. Uh, and the last two GMOE um, placement is like only in the last few blocks in the like last uh, last two well, last two blocks you place you place the GMOE block uh, like every two. Uh, in in our every two uh, mechanisms, <clears throat> uh, and here we also validate some like the results from the uh, detailed configurations or uh, alternation. Uh, you can see that the last two cosine routers uh, have the best uh, ha have the best performance uh, on many of the data sets. And here is uh, also the interesting things we find that. Uh, so previously we just show some video examples, and here we show like statistically uh, whether the uh, the MOE the experts would align with some uh, visual attributes here. Uh, we process the uh, a famous dataset called CUB. It's a fine grained bird recombination dataset. We process it to four domains uh, using some like data augmentation or stylization techniques. Uh, and uh, in the CUB uh, data set, it has the uh, it has a label for different visual attributes because uh, we can uh, it, it, uh, it has the labels for like the the location of the leg of the wing, but we did not use this uh, label to train our MOE. We just use the classification labels to train our MOE, and we investigated. In inside a MOE block, the routers, the the routers uh, assignment, whether it associated with the certain facial attributes. So here we can find that the E zero to E five is a stacks experts configuration. Um, we can find that the E three may be mostly associated with beak and the left and right leg and left and right wing. And uh, the E five may be associated with uh, like other other types of visual attributes, uh, and this is uh, and and this may be uh, and and and, th th and th this results may be some like you can see that some experts may possess multiple visual attributes. Uh, this is because we only use six experts. But if you extend the extend the results, you can see uh, more fine grained more. Uh, more fine grained association with experts uh, between between experts and the visual attributes, and here's uh, the visualization on the expert selections. Here's a uh, more vivid uh, results is that you can see in different images the the same experts uh, the the same experts extra three. 
uh, the X or three are associated with the beak in different images, in different uh, uh, recognizing the bird in different images, and the the tail are processed by uh, also by expert three in different images. And also here's uh, here's an overall results of our uh, of our uh, of our works. Uh, we compared on uh, the most SOTA algorithms, and you can see that it's uh, mostly way better than the previous SOTA methods. Uh, the even with the EIM, the VITS uh, sixteen this architecture, and uh, we we cited it because this uh, this is proposed by Vision Transformer, uh, and um. The, we can see that the results is way better, and the GMO yeast results is also uh, improved from the from the VIT baseline. Uh, and uh, and here is a, a detailed comparison is to investigate it, uh, the in distribution accuracy compared to the out of distribution accuracy. Uh, and you can see that uh, we use the ResNet uh, ResNet fifty. V2 architecture, it has a uh, uh it, it has a better results on ImageNet 1K, uh, but uh it may not lead to better results on the manualization task. That's interesting because it's uh, what we claim that uh in using the VIT and the GMOE of better architectures would naturally lead to a better manualization performance. And uh this also validates our claims in our paper. Um, and also, we provide a very interesting <clears throat> evaluation strategy called single source domain generation. Uh, it basically means you only train your models on one domain and test on the many others domain. Uh, we train in this in this table. We train the our models on the paint domain, uh, and we evaluate the performance on other domains. And you can see you can also see that uh, the the MOE performance is way better than the ResNet architectures. And the IID's improvement is, um, uh, the, I, the IID's improvement uh, is relatively small, but the OD improvement is very large. Uh, and so um, in conclusions, here's a few takeaways. Uh, so maybe uh, the analysis parts, the theoretical parts may be complicated, but I also, but, but that's not necessary. I, I just want to conclude some very useful takeaways. The first is that uh, we propose uh, the algorithmic alignment tool in domain generation. Uh, theoretically, maybe some machine learning uh, researchers would be interested in using this uh, using this tool to um, to to further analysis uh, in this architecture's perspective uh, in domain generation or in out of uh, domain detections or whatever is in, in this uh, broad era. Um, so this is our first takeaway. And the second is uh, we encourage the, the audience and we uh, like uh, whether in, in the talks or in the public, uh, public announcement, we would encourage that the audience to uh, try to discover the uh, a better architectures instead of uh, so in, in parallel with developing a uh, better like algorithms uh, in searching for the loss or in searching for the uh, optimization schedules or so whatever. Uh, and we want to say that the architecture is really important. Uh, it will provide you, uh, it will simply let, let, let you uh, let, a, let you a better results. Yes, it's just uh, my conclusions here. Um, Uh, Boy, thank you so much uh, uh, taking time to uh, to prepare this slide and then giving a presentation in SLS talk here. Thanks a, a lot again. Uh, so uh, we'll wait. Uh, uh, the participants may may ask questions or they can you know unmute themselves and uh, directly ask a question to Boli and or uh, is there anyone asking? Uh, or they can write uh, in the chat box as well. So uh, let's wait uh, for, for them. But uh, let me quickly uh, ask you one question, Boli. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not uh, in this field of domain generalization. So uh, it's a very, very philosophical uh, kind of thing. Why, why is it uh, so important uh, to do research in the field of domain generalization? What could be the impact of domain generalization? Uh, basically in, in the scientific domain. But mm-hmm. you, you got my, why is it important in your point of view? Okay. Uh, so I think this will uh, come from like this example. Um, mm-hmm. Like in previous years, uh, especially when we train a neural network in limited data, uh, assuming that we are a, a small company, we don't have access to the large amount of the, the the user's data. We train us. We train the neural network on a limited amount of data, and mm-hmm. it will perform very poorly on its unseen data. Okay. Yes. It so says that's that is a critical scenario uh, that we need to address. Um, so uh, let's say if we have a company, an uh, 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 auto, autonomous driving company, uh, it if its data are trained on, um, in, in like in, in China or in Singapore, but it did not see the 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 street things in Europe or in in United States. Uh, you cannot just uh, develop this algorithm because it may just right. cannot recognize the things in in that right. scenarios. Right. And we right. yes, and I think DG is encouraged. We trained on limited data. Uh, if we train on limited data, we encourage the trainings. Uh, like uh, develop a better training uh, training schedule or develop a better model uh, to like be more robust to its unseen data. Mm-hmm. A lot of, um, a kind of more robust, but um, so it's we just we, we, we hope to uh, do. Uh, okay. Okay. That's pretty, pretty clear. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, what about this? Uh, this uh, Bellman Ford algorithm, uh, um, mm-hmm. because I saw you talking about the Bellman Ford uh, algorithm as well, somewhere in one of the slides, I think. Uh, is it related to the work that you 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 have uh, presented here? Is it the base of the the work that you have done? Uh, yeah, it, it's it, it's a uh, like it's a um, uh, it, it's a previous work. It's a mentioned in previous work, and it's what we relied on. It's the algorithmic alignment to is proposed uh, in this work uh, from the Shikha Yudu's work, What Can Your Network Read About? Uh, in his work, he proposed that a GN would uh, uh, be a good learner for the Bellman Ford algorithm uh, because he studies the uh, graph neural network. So he, uh, he, proves this, uh, he proves this statement in his scenario. <laughs> Oh, uh, what I mean is like, does it have to do anything with the with the domain generalization? Oh, I, I see. Uh, yeah, it's a tool we rely on to uh, analyze the uh, importance of the architectures in domain generalization. Like we motivated by by his uh, by this algorithmic alignment tool uh, in GN scenario, and we extended it to the domain generalization scenario, and we like prove something in our scenario uh, oh, and our country, okay. yes. Mm, okay, uh, I got your point, I got your point. Okay, uh, I think uh, it's really a wonderful work and uh, uh, I wish you good luck. You already, did you already present uh, this work in the ICLR uh, conference, Bolly? Oh, I actually did not. I I, oh, I okay. still have a few days. I I, I think I oh. should like prepare it more readily because uh mm-hmm. I think is this may kind of of the uh, something new to 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 the audience, especially right. when when audience studying the dimensionalization. Uh, right. they may be uh yes uh there's there's a lot of the new things like the epistemic alignment and the. Uh, the analysis, the assumptions, then I should mm-hmm. think I have a better organization to, to introduce right. this topic. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Bodhi. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our um, invitation and then, you know, uh, giving a wonderful presentation and a very important field of research. Uh, 
uh, basically in the area of machine machine learning, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, I wish you uh, good luck for the uh, for the presentation, final presentation there mm -hmm. in ICLR as well. And uh, thank you, participants. Uh, uh, thanks to all the participants who attended this this SLS talk. And um, uh, for now. Um, I think we have to say uh, I have to say goodbye to everyone, mm -hmm. and we'll see in the next uh, SLS uh, talk twenty seven. And to all the participants, if you have any queries, I think you can uh, you can uh, go and talk to uh, Boli. He's in uh, lab S lab, so called S lab. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And Boli, have a good day. And all the participants have a good day. Uh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. And bye bye, everyone. Boli, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bye.